Let's go. There you go. Gentlemen, it's all yours. All righty, let's do this. Okay, the last and final one it is, Mastering Part 2, eight of eight sessions that we've started back in December 8th, finishing today on Jan 21st. Thank you all for being here. Um, Mr. Herman, Mr. Xavier, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, our very own host, Mr. KJ Singh, thank you, sir, for being here with us. A quick um, intro to Mr. KJ. Mm -hmm. I'm sure all of you already know Mr. KJ Singh, but for the ones who don't, minority, um, I just want to say a few words. Uh, a very familiar face uh, in the audio business, music producer, audio engineer with over 35 years of experience in engineering, mixing, mastering albums, films, and even live concerts. Uh, Mr. KJ Singh was uh, A.R. Rahman's live sound engineer for all his concerts since 2003. And uh, he's also engineered bigger bands like Parikrama, Indian Ocean, The Colonial Cousins, Hariharan, Euphoria, <clears throat> so on. Um, he's also won multiple awards from the AES India community, Filmfare, um, and even the Presidential National Award for the category of Best Sound Design. Wow. Um, and uh, the list of feature films, telefilms, um, commercials, corporate films, corporate songs, and radio that KJ Sir has done, I've had a look at his profile, is several pages, page after page after page, just so much of stuff that he's done. Um, he's also an educator. He's worked with the Mumbai University um, Digital Academy, also in Mumbai, Zima, uh, and also with Apple. Uh, teaching Logic Pro and Main Stage back in 2009. Wow. Uh, yeah, there's just so many things that uh, KJ Sir has done in the past and definitely such an experienced person. And most of all, such a friendly, approachable person who is such, who's been such a great inspiration and a role model to most of us in the Indian audio business. Uh, thank you, sir, for being part of the event and thank you for hosting this. Uh, I'll shut up now and I'll pass on the session to you. Over to you, sir. This is all yours. Ah, uh, thank you, Vivin. Uh, all those things kind of just lets everybody know how old and a dinosaur. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> uh, so also in, in many firsts, I believe this is happening on this eight classes that uh, we've had, uh, which pro musicals have organized for us. And uh, uh Sorry, am I gone? Oh, yeah. So it's Pro Musicals organized and SPL um, and Herman and Xavier have been part of it. So many firsts, I was talking with them and they said this is the first time they've, they've done an eight class kind of webinar together in one go. And that's the first for them and it's splitting into various topics. And maybe it's the first time that they've had a host for the second time in the same class. And that's me. So there are many firsts True, to too. this. Uh, uh, thank you. That means you all are very patient, very kind that you're allowing me to be myself. And I think that's a big thing in the audio industry. And I was having a chat with Herman earlier as well as to how did he see and how did he come about these shows and how, how does he feel about it? And he's saying he's just being himself, uh, which is a great storyteller who combines his passion for what he does with all the background contextual stuff with it. And I think that's what makes it interesting. I, I'm sure all of you have attended so many webinars, seminars, particularly in the last two years online. And I think you can see and hear the difference in when he is conducting uh, these particular seminars. Uh, they are so friendly. They are in a language which is so easy to understand. And he is just being himself. He is being human. If he doesn't like anything, he says so. If he likes something, he says so. And he also explains, and if he doesn't know, he'll say so. I think that's the beauty of this entire thing with Herman particularly. And thank you so much for being yourself, Herman. And he's the co-founder of SPL and Xavier, the VP of sales, uh, who's uh, helping him along and who's looking for an ally to kind of uh, poke some stuff into Herman once in a while. So I can see that happening. And yes, you have me there for a while, Xavier, definitely. <laughs> so without my further ado, uh, I would like to hand over this session to uh, Herman to talk about the second phase of mastering. We had one on Wednesday, which he talked about the pass EQ, the PQ and the iron. If those of you who are here, you must have been through it. And we had a beautiful chat session after that. I would encourage everybody to 
please uh, ping on the chat lines if you need to ask something to understand. The chunks of the basic questions can be done later, but if there is something which is very relevant to what he's speaking right there and then, which might need an explanation, you can chime it in and Xavier will be very nice and sweet and kind in his beautiful house to kind of post it across and talk to all of us. We really don't know if Xavier is in his own house, by the way, but we are assuming he is. So uh, <laughs> let's get on with uh, Herman taking the stage for the second part of mastering about the routing equipment that they make. Surprisingly, it's all in red. And that's a question I'll reserve for later. So <laughs> over to you, Herman. And thanks once again for doing this, man. Really nice. Really, really nice of you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, KJ. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, yeah. So the, the red question. No, you can all get this in uh, black as well. And we also have an all black uh, series. Uh, so there, that there is uh, color wise something for everybody. But for me, I just really like the red stuff. Some people don't, I do. So for today's session, um, what we're gonna talk about first, we're gonna start talking about the, the, the DMC, the mastering console. And um, yeah, so that's the centerpiece of your studio where you connect everything to, that's the first step. Then we're gonna talk about integration of um, processing equipment into your mastering chain uh, with the help of Hermes. Um, that's a router and uh, um, a storable router, I might add. Then we do a bit of um, MS, mass, uh, MS processing, um, how, that, how you can use that in mastering. Just briefly touch the DA converter that we have. And finally, we, can, we talk about the integration of immersive audio into, into a, a stereo workspace, because that's what everybody's facing as the problem right now you're going to be asked to do immersive stuff or surround stuff or whatever you might call it so you have multiple speaker arrays and in in fact when you do your stereo work which is for most of us still the main job you have your main setup in stereo and you want to use the left and right speaker uh, also for the multi-channel and how are you going to do that without replugging it. So we have solutions for that. And that's pretty much at, at the end of this. So let me give it a go. Um, and as last time, I'm, I'm trying to use, you can see that, that camera. I hope that. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, Xavier helps me to put this on. He asked me to be very stable with my left hand. So please apologize if I'm not. Um, OK. Let's start here, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, the DMC, this piece, in the first place. Oh, yeah, and I'm going to switch this additional light on so that we have a bit more. So that should be, a f is F this cool for everybody? Yes. Okay, that's nice. So the setup, as you can see, um, is pretty, yeah. Uh, symmetrical in a way. Up here, you have your selection for your inputs. So you have four stereo inputs and I, I labeled them as DAW or Phono. I have a, um, a record player in the back and an, a Crimson product and the NEOS console that I have here. These are my, my inputs. The inputs are um, those that you want to um, that you use for mastering. So everything that you want to master, you put in here. If you have reference um, signals that you want to compare your work with, these are the four buttons for that. So you have four inputs and four sources. The sources are only for monitoring. They will never go out on the recording bus. And you can pre-select them here. And once you stop, Use, and once you use the source button down here, it means that this one is going to be applied to the, uh, to, to the monitoring path. And if you deactivate that, you're gonna hear the inputs. Now, a few things that you can control here. First of all, you have um, left and right, just on buttons for the left and the right channels. Um, then you have phase inversal for the left and the right. So separate phase inversal for both sides. You have a mono switch over here and you have a, um, a rec gain switch up here that actually activates this control, the recording gain control. 
Now, if you don't want to have this control in your signal path, you just deactivate it and the relay takes this out of the, 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 the path. We try to keep the audio uh, path as um, yeah, short as possible. Uh, less electronics in the path is always a good thing. So what would you use this for? Well, um, you can use it to fine trim the gaining that goes to your converter, to your AD stage, that's one thing. But what we think it is more useful for or what were uh, those mastering engineers that like to do manual gain writes during mastering while printing. And yes, this exists. And it seems to be yeah, the more educated you get in mastering, I, well, I'm not, I'm not that good. Um, for me, it's just like I'm building this equipment and it's a hobby for me to work with that and, and, and master stuff. But when I talk to the real good guys doing that, they really love this. And they, they tell you there is something you can put into this mastering that is, um, has to do with um, feeling. If you draw this on, on a screen and you just make a nice looking line, there is nothing really that is correlated with your feelings when you listen to the song. Uh, it's just a drawn line and the computer does it for you. So in terms of adding that one dB when you go to the chorus or taking that one and a half dB off when you try to get into a, a, a more mellow part of, the, of a song and to, to get this, the song really dynamic and the way it, it does that, to control that by hand and by feeling, that's a valuable thing for, for many mastering engineers. And I can only encourage you to, to work with that. Um, it puts some load on your shoulders while printing, but that's also the beauty of it. You're really stay, stay focused. Right, then we have um, trims. An input trim for the left side, input trim for the right side. Now, you can see here, that's a toggle switch and that's the same as we have on the iron. So you have one uh, a switch that in this case, it, it, it really go, is, goes round and around and it does very small incremental steps. So I can engage this, as long as it's set in the center, this toggle switch, you will, there will be no change. But if you, you can go to minus or to plus. Now, you can see these are quarter dB steps quarter dB steps, and they continue to be a quarter of a dB up to two dB. And, and beyond that, it is uh, um, half dB and then uh, um, full dB, and then it's a two dB step to up to six dB. So it's, the reason for that is when you work with um, uh, L, um, analog gear, and the balancing stages usually have a level offset in the realm of a quarter of a dB. So if you have one dB steps, um, for this is not allowing you to compensate for that. So that's why we have opted to go that fine for an adjustment on the inputs for left and right. Okay, then here in the center section, um, you, we have that auto bypass uh, switch, and that is well. well I explained this um, on Wednesday. You can just engage it, and and um, this insert will be switched off, or the source. You can say if it's going to be insert or source related. Let's say if you want to come to to compare your mastering with somebody else's production that your customer, your client asks you to sound alike, then you will put it on here and then you switch on um, the, the auto bypass to source and the relay will switch between your mix and the source mix without you touching anything. So you can focus on just the difference. And the same applies to the insert. So, okay, you got it going to disengage this. So um, it applies to the insert. So your entire insert chain that is present on this one can also be automated uh, by set, selecting this going to insert. And you noticed while this is on, I cannot actually do this manually. This overrides this action. And the same with the source. Once it's engaged, it stays engaged, but it is 
switching off without switching the lights off. So you don't actually know if you're listening to one or the other. And that's the good thing because it should, you should be focusing on hearing and not on a visual indicator that tells you, oh, this is what I just did for the last two hours. It's got to be better. Well, I, I get trapped myself by, by this, I have to admit. So moving over here, you have the four um, uh, speakers. These are all um, stereo speakers, except for um, the, the D. That's a mono speaker for, for some yeah, aura tone or whatever. I still have, as you can see, I still have these very old aura tones sitting here. They're like from 1973 or something. Um, then you have um, the Fonitor out. I mean, that's actually an, an additional output for a headphone amplifier. And what you can do, there are multiple things you can sort of um, program in this device. Now, if, uh, for example, if I engage my monitor output, it automatically disengages the speakers. So, because that's what I want. When I want to listen to my headphones, I don't want to hear them with the speakers, but I don't want to do to touch all the buttons and uh, um, I just want to link them. So what you do to link, and that applies for all of the functions I'm going to show you later, you just press both for a certain time. Now it flashes rather slowly and now it's unlinked. So now you can just do your phone, add the phone to your main output. And if you want to link them again, you just press both. Now it's flashing fast and it tells you now I'm linked. So once this is on, it will disengage it. There is also a sub output. And uh, with the sub, you can um, tell, also tell the unit, I, on my mains, I don't need the sub. But when I switch to the rear, to, to my near field, I want to have the sub engage. So you can also link these two. And now when you engage, press your near field, it automatically switches on the sub as well. If you switch over to your mains, they're gone. So these are very nice features that you don't find in pretty, I don't know any other mastering console that does these kind of tricks. They're usually hardwired and, and these kind of combinations are not possible. Actually in behind the front panel, there is a little computer that, that catches all these information, stores them. And uh, yeah, that's a big help to make these kind of things possible. Now, down here, you see there is an insert uh, return trim for the left and an insert return trim for the right channel. So that's exactly the same as you have here on the input side. These two. And there are also feature quality B steps. Yeah, you use this to, uh, to level. I mean, if you go through a certain processing channel, there's obviously a level difference just because of the, the sheer fact that all of the uh, balancing I.O. stages will have a little bit of a difference. So you can compensate for this, but also if you have like a tremendous loudness increase on your return, which you don't really want, you can, you can use um, the trims for that. But there is also a feature that I would like to, to, to show you in terms of comparing, because loudness is in mastering um, a very, uh, let's say, uh, dominant, thing. Not so much these days because the loudness more is going down. Uh, and that's because iTunes and other formats, they don't, uh, they actually decrease the playback level of, of songs that are mastered too loud, which is a good thing. So what we put in here, we have um, a level offset control, a switch up here with a control that does plus and minus 10 dB only on the monitoring, not on the recording, obviously. Now, um, if let's say you are listening to your, uh, to your mastering and, and you are engaging your insert. Now your insert actually starts to be pretty, uh, because you gained loudness, let's say you gained like this amount of gum loudness, for example. Now you are, you're gonna link these two, and I have to just like, that you're going to press them together so and now every time you engage your insert the loudness compensation on the monitoring is instantly active 
So thereby you can precisely set the loudness increase and you can also uh, get an indicator how loud that difference is. And it follows that. You can do that and link this to, uh, to other parameters. For example, if you wanna link it to the source engagement, you can do like this. Now it flashes fast and it tells you now, and now every time you switch uh, the source, it does that. Let's say the source material that somebody gave you is, is lesser in level, or if it's louder in level, you just compensate your own by increasing that. And then it engages it when you press the, the source. You can also do this, I guess, I don't know if, it, if this was a recent thing that somebody wanted as a mastering engineer, he wanted to have this individually uh, linked to one of the inputs. Now, I don't know if my hand is that, can do that with one, that's a bit far. Um, just hold on, I try this, I'll put this like here, and then let me try this like this. Yeah, it does it. So that's the, that's the new software as well. So. I'm, I'm now selected one specific source. And if I engage this, oh, sorry, <laughs> if I engage this, did it follow? Oh yeah, I, I have to press this one, the source button, obviously, but then it only picks up on, on the Hawkeye. And I think if I do this now, it doesn't pick up on, see, now it doesn't pick up on the three. It only picks up on, on the Hawkeye. All right, uh, you, there is more to that because you can also link inputs to this. And there's one special feature that we have on the inputs, which I really like, that is um, you press an input, like in this case, the workstation, you press this twice and you see that now the knob is slowly blinking. And that indicates that your input is being sent to the output without anything applied to it. Let's say all of these switch functions and all of these trims are, are not, now you cannot listen to them. If you do like gain changes, mono, whatever, this would bypass everything. And it's a good help because once you are working with stuff and you're controlling things, you at one point want to go back, okay, what am I sending from the workstation anyway, just to be clear on what I'm doing here. So you just press this a second time so that it blinks and you get that feed. And once you press it again, the input remains the same, but now it flows through everything that you adjusted on the console. Okay. Uh, so here on the, on the right side in the monitoring section, besides the, of that level offset for loudness checking, there is a minus 20 dB dim. There is also a mono function and there is a mute, general mute. When you boot the unit, the DMC, the mute will always be on just as a protective measure. So don't worry uh, or don't wonder when, uh, uh, when there is the audio playing immediately. This uh, is a default that we have the mute on for safety, for safety reasons. Then there is solo left, solo right, and phase inversal left, phase inversal right. But this is just on the monitoring side, whereas this would be the phase inversal that also works on, uh, on the um, record, on the input that is being recorded and printed. Okay, um, monitoring level, and this one features a nice illuminated uh, uh, dot here, an indicator. Uh, and people really like that because you can see your monitoring level from a greater distance. Once you then get up and you walk around in your room, you want to look over, okay, how loud is that now? Where is it set? And you get a feel for, for the settings that you shows. So to have that pretty visual is a good thing. And the last interesting little push button up here is called GPI. GPI is, is just an abbreviation for a general purpose interface. So what it actually is, there is a connector on, on the uh, back panel. It's, it's a stereo jack connector, TRS, and you can connect pretty much anything to this switch. Let's say you want to, uh, people are getting on your nerve because you're working and they, they don't, um, yeah, be, they just interrupt your sessions. So what you could do is you link your red, your um, red light 
in front of the studio to this button, right? Or you link the buzzer of the door to this button or your coffee machine power up or whatever. So you can do some nice things that you usually do when you work with this one. Okay, now that's uh, um, the DMC for now. And um, uh, any any questions on the DMC? Yeah, uh, Herman. Yeah. KJ here. Uh, one, one observation and two questions. One observation being that that light on that monitoring thing, red one, I knew masking was a black art, but I think you kind of gave it a little light, so which is a good thing. Uh, the other being that your input, you have the, uh, the recording gain and you also have input trims. Don't they kind of overlap in function or uh, why would the, we have two of them just to get more uh, input if you want or what is it for? Um, yeah, well, obviously, yeah, it's gain, it's gain staging, and uh, the, the trims are designed to do fixed stationary um, level gain staging, and that is what, in that case, you only put one resistor into the audio chain and not a whole amplifier with a potentiometer. That is always more I mean, affecting sound, we will probably not hear a difference at all. But there is some good feeling about the fact that, okay, I don't want to use that pot in my mastering chain now. People are very subtle about these things. So um, you can disengage them and the entire op, op amp with the potentiometer and the surrounding electronics has been taken out of the signal pass. And the trim is just a passive cut. Right, and it, it just cuts that. And if it's good, if you select for active, well, then you obviously have an operational amplifier that gives you that minimal offset or trim gain to just level the stationary gain staging correctly. The, the recording gain is more, it's not for stationary things. It's like, okay, now I'm adapting to my AD converter, for example. So you play the song, you move forward to the area where you have the biggest peaks. Um, so usually in the last third of the song, you play that multiple times and you adjust the gaining to, to hit your AD converter just perfectly. That's one application for the recording gain. And the other, as I said, is gain rights. But that's mm. something that not many people are used to or want to do or whatever. That's something very specific. And I, the more educated they are, the mastering engineers, the more they like this, but some never tried it because they never had the possibility at hand. Uh, so they yeah, were, I... so they were drawing just lines on on the screen in their workstation, and oh, that looks nice. Um, ah, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. But uh, um, now there is a possibility to put this feeling into your hand. I would rather like to have a fader, because in, in my days we used faders for that, and there is a natural movement in that fader movement. To translate this into a part movement needs some training. I have to admit that. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. And whose hand did you use to kind of measure the hand span for the monitor and the monitoring out. Oh, I don't, I don't, sorry, I didn't understand that question. I'm just wondering whose hand did you use to measure the distance <laughs> between the monitor out and the monitoring <laughs> and the monitor out? Because, I mean, it must have um, been a big hand. Um, uh, well, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's just happened. <laughs> okay. Right. Herman? Yes. What are the sweet signal input levels to drive this unit to get the best out of it? Um, ah, yeah. Brings me back to the fact that with that rail that we run, we don't have that sweet spot issue. You, it, it doesn't really matter. Honestly, it does not matter. You can put into minus six, you can put in plus 10, you can put in plus 20. There is... Because of, of the 120 volt rail, there is no such thing as a saturation happening where, where we get close to the operational uh, um, voltage. Or to where I know that you get these effects with pretty much all of the other mastering uh, gear that are not using 120 volt rail because they simply, uh, if you put like plus 18 dB in there, then if they run a, a, a plus or minus 
24 volts at, at about 24 dB, 23 point so and so dB, that's it. And if you run your audio into that, you come in with plus 18 and you add EQ and you have a gain increase because you added loudness, you suddenly push your monitoring controller or your recording console to the edge of its performance. And that is exactly where, where the components start to exhibit their special sound characteristics, sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a not so good way. And that's where you ask yourself, where is the sweet spot? I totally understandable because you don't want to hit that point. Um, and with the DMC, well, we go up to 33 point so-and-so dB. So there is no input level that you have that would actually get this thing to that point. So it doesn't really matter. Does that answer it? Probably. I will let you know. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Um, Shall, shall I continue with the uh, uh, with the Hermes then, or um, if if yeah we can yes yeah. okay no great. other questions sir all right so Hermes um, as you can see down here can you can you select that for me yeah thank you uh, okay now Hermes is a device um, that allows you to connect eight stereo processors and you can freely select the routing of these processors. Now that works the following way. Let's just assume I create a new routing and I press new, right? Now all of the buttons are disengaged. And what I want to do first is let's say I want to apply uh, a bit of uh, what, 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 what I want to do. Um, uh, yeah, I say, okay, I'm just gonna keep it simple. I make a bit of compression and then I will add a passive, the passive equalizer. Uh, then I will add the PQ equalizer and that's it for now. So if you want to do that, you just press store and you select one of the three buttons down here. Let's take one. Now, uh, you want to know whether a change in that routing would actually sound better. Let's say you want to EQ first and then you compress. So you select a new one and you're going to make PQ, then you, the, oh, I said, yeah, the PESEC and then the iron. And you're going to store this in number two. So now by just selecting these presets, you can see how the order changes. And you can immediately tell, okay, in this case, it is better to whatever, do the compression first or the EQing first. Now you can make more complex uh, uh, things. Let's just assume you're gonna, that's what I usually do here because I have the Gemini as an MS processor. We're gonna talk about that in a bit. But the, what I do in the first place is I go into my MS encoder. So that means I'm, I'm sending a signal into the Gemini and now, uh, the inserted processor, let's say I want to start with the iron again, means that my iron over here, the left side, is going to be on the, on the center, on the, on the mono mid center, whereas my right side is the compressor for the side. And in my bus, I want to have also the PQ as a, uh, um, the left channel working for the center, for, for the mono mid, and this is the stereo side. So I'm going to do this as my third. And now I want to close the MS loop like this. Now the MS decoder is coming into the, into the game from, from the Gemini. And now I'm back to stereo. And in my stereo world, I want to do um, the, the, the PESEC, as the next one. So this is number five. And then I'm sending it out to my A80 uh, Studer mass recorder, which is over there in the back. And um, I'm sending it there and I'm getting it back uh, at, at the same time. Uh, so I only get the effect of tape saturation. And I wanna store this, let's say this is my number three. So now you have all these things right at your disposal. There is a master bypass switch over here that bypasses everything you did. But 
also, if you are, if you want to bypass individual things, individual processes, you can still do that here in your chain. You can see there's always the name popping up, right? When I do this, this is, you can program that. Uh, I won't go into detail here, but this, you hold this for two seconds and then the, um, the labels start to flash and you can select ABC, uh, downward, upward and numbers. And then you use the enter to, to uh, label all of your processes. You can see what I did. I, I put like little labels into the, into the switches. Usually they obviously don't come with that, but I guess we have a, um, a form page. It's 10 by 10 millimeters anyway. So if, if you just print that, I did that on, on, on a straightforward uh, laser printer and cut it out and inserted it. So I have this all being labeled uh, nicely. All right, now that's not all. Let's just think um, I'm, um, I have this sequence, fine. Now in my, my iron here on, on, on position A is a compressor. And I want to use this compressor in um, with my parallel mix stage here. So I'm going to activate the parallel mix stage. And now I can, and I need to assign that stage to the iron. And in here, this is my, my parallel uh, mix number one. I'm just pressing this and it gives me the positions. So this is E. It, see that little dot beside the one? It starts at, at, uh, at one in the chain. See, that tells you there is a parallel mix inserted, but I don't want to have it there. I want to have it in position number three. So I press it a second time. And now you see the second position would be A. And that is exactly what I want. So now, and, yeah. and if you want to store this, you're going to press this and you're going to store this again. And now, as you can see, also the parallel mix is stored. That little dot tells you that. So, and, and I probably, um, just for the fun of it, you could do the, the second one with the Studer, but I, I tell you later why this won't really work. I tried it and I find it. And my Studer is on position number six, yeah. right? So I so press this until I get to, uh, it's position six, but uh, it's, it's the number D that I need to get here, D. So now you can see that second dot appears there beside the six. Now, uh, now you can go and, and say, okay, this is dry. So it will be what you send to, to the studer. And this is wet, what comes back from the studer. In fact, as there is a delay between the recording head and the repro head, you cannot, you cannot do this. I tried it and you get this, it doubles and it, and it yeah, Doppler effect type of thing that happens. Okay, but on, on parallel and mix number one, well, you can do I now have the iron and in the dry position, there is no processing on the iron. And if you turn it in, this is only the iron and everything in between is a mixture of the original sound and your compressed sound. Now, what you can do is, uh, usually when you don't use parallel mix, it is, and you insert a compressor, it is always a hundred percent wet. So the full compressor signal. That means that you would probably set on the compressor, you would probably set certain parameters in a more moderate way. But if you have this parallel mix, what you could do is I only use, let's say 50%, of the sound of the compressor, the rest is the original. But what I want to do then is I want to really heavily over compress this so that I get a certain punch or a certain sound out of it that added by 50% gives me a different result. Finally, if you have like level differences, you can engage um, a, a, another potentiometer that compensates for any difference that you had uh, using that specific processor. So that if you don't want to have it, you just switch it off and it's no longer in the circuit. Right, that is the Hermes. And um, any questions to that? Yes, there's, um, there's a discussion going on on the chat. Uh, maybe you can have a look on it. Um, 
it it starts with uh, Aditya who says maybe you want to read it or I can another conversation talking about the audio equipment being designed to function at 110 120 while the Indian is 220 and there was a talk of how the cleanness of the electricity delivered affects the quality of the audio from the device can you elaborate on this wait 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 then you have other things India <laughs> India also functions at 50 hertz cycles Yes, uh, US is six thirds, correct. Uh, this is not about the incoming AC voltage. I know, but I want to understand if how this will affect functioning of hardware. Just a question for whenever I can be, for, yeah. Um, I, indeed, that is something that people do discuss. Um, and this is especially um, uh, when you talk to people doing, uh, uh, with their guitar amps. They're saying their Marshall guitar head sounds better in, in the UK than it does in the US because of that half the AC voltage, primary AC voltage. I've been reading about the same things. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, I have to say, why um, why the, that the difference is obviously you have to build the power supply entirely different when you only have half the voltage. The, um, the cycles, 50 or 60 hertz, they don't matter too much. But it's um, obviously you need to get the same amount of secondary voltage out of it. And that's a different, um, a different rectifying going on when you go from 220 or 240 or whatever it is in Europe. I mean, India and Europe, we have the same thing. If you do that and you go to like your secondary voltage, which is 120 in our case, or you take an AC that is 110 and your secondary is 120. There is a different way of rectifying and it all depends. I mean, I don't, I think that in, in, in the, uh, in the heads and the guitar heads with all these tube gear and the transformers and everything involved that there is a bigger difference to that i've not really heard that coming along as a comment or an observation between us mastering engineers and european mastering engineers that they think that a product of ours would sound better in europe than it would in in the us i hope that Okay, but, um, I hope that answers it. Um, anything, um, anything else? No, nope, not on my side. All right. So um, the next thing is is the Gemini, and um, the Gemini. Uh, yeah, I call it Gemini because it's uh, like the the twins of of of, of stereo. Um, the uh, AB stereo or LR stereo. Uh, um, versus the MS stereo. Uh, yeah, MS stereo is the wrong word. The MS, uh, uh, how can you say that? Uh, MS means mid and side. So you create a mid signal, which is over here in that section. And the mid is basically derived by adding the left and the right channel. So, and, and the result is a mono channel, a mono mid channel. It's everything that is in the phantom center, everything that belongs to both sides to, in the same way, in the same level is being present on the mid side. Whereas on the side, here is the difference between um, left and right. So you, you, you subtract one channel from the other and thereby what remains is the difference between the left and the right channels. So everything that is off center, it's also a mono signal. So many of, I, I talked to many people and I said, well, but the side signal must be stereo because it's your side to the, no, it is not. This is a mono signal. And just as a bit of a background, MS has been used since the very, very early days of FM radio. Now you might wonder when you had FM back in the days, uh, we're using antennas and stuff. And when you switch to mono, you were hearing it much clearer. 
And sometimes when you get into a reception where you start, where the reception starts to get a bit better, then it would suddenly get stereo and then mono again and stereo and then mono again. And if you had superb, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, if, if the signal was really, really good and strong, you could listen to stereo. Now, what they actually did back in the days was they split the, 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 the signal that was going on air, they split it up into mid and side signal, two mono signals on two different frequencies. And the one was very strong. The mono was the one that had to be always present and the stereo was an add-on it was just like oh yeah if it's really going to be a good reception hey you get stereo um but you can you remember you also get noise introduced by that sometimes the stereo when it switched to stereo it, it had this background noise to it but it was actually on a different frequency and that's how they um, imagine if they would have done this all in, 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 in stereo and your signal would break up or whatever, it, you couldn't really listen to the information to, to the radio well. So MS comes from radio transmission days, I think it's like 60 odd years old. In mastering, it had become like a certain renaissance because if you get a stereo mix and you should master a stereo mix, you need to process left and right pretty much equally. Sometimes with analog gear, that is not even, yeah, it is, it is possible to a certain precision. In digital, it's obviously there's more precision because of the digital side of things, but that's easier there. But coupling analog processors is not that easy. And you may have compressors or EQs, like which are mono. And you just have one, but you want to use this on, let's say, the main tracks, like vocals and snare and kick or whatever. So these are all, the main tracks are usually always present in the mid, because that's where you hear the lead vocal. That's where you hear the snare and the kick and the bass guitar. Whereas your synth, your guitars and whatever, who are spread out in the stereo, they are their portion of the stereo side is in, in the side signal. Now, mid and side allows you now to, let's say, work on, on, a, uh, on, on the vocal here in the mid, whereas your guitars, which are in the same frequency range, are almost not affected because they are more in the side signal. So what the, the, the things that you can adjust here, you have a, an insert. I, I have to leave that on because the insert is going here to my Hermes and a solo, which allows you to only listen to the, to the mid and the side is switched off. And you have another trim and balance switch that um, engages this balance, which is a super fine, like plus and minus three and a half dB control if there if your input has a little bit of an offset to one side you can compensate this here only for the mids uh, so let's say your vocal is not that center your kick drum is not that center you would use that this for that um, and you have a little you have a trim control also with only plus and minus two and a half dB so so super fine you can trim the amount of mid level to the side level and here on the sides, while well, you have the same solo button, you have another switch that engages filter and width. Now, this is now the, the, um, the really cool part that many mastering engineers use to broaden the, um, the, the, the stereo image. And when they say they use MS to do that, what they usually effectively do is they increase the level of the side signal. And the louder the side signal becomes, the wider the stereo image is. Keep a good eye on your, con on your uh, correlation meter so that it doesn't get into negative phase. The elliptical filter is a filter that um, sets a frequency below which the frequencies are being sent over to the side and above which they are going into the stereo enhancement. So let's say into the wider making of the stereo image. Thereby, you can 
effectively control the portion that or the sub the, the, the base frequency state that should not be part of the stereo um, spreading. Um, and it, an elliptical filter is a very special filter because at that frequency that you select here, the face flips about 180 degrees. And by doing this, the, because these two are totally out of phase by a, a mid end side, they have a 180 degree phase shift between the two. But, and if you apply that filter, everything below that set frequency is now inverted by 180 degrees. And when you mix them together to become a stereo signal, an LR stereo signal, they appear here in the, in, in the mono mix. So you don't lose any frequencies. They just go to the, uh, to the mids portion of it. That's the beauty of that ellipt elliptical filter. Okay, and that's my two coins on two cents on mitten side. So okay. any questions to that? Yes, there is. Um... Herman, how do you approach mid-side processing when it comes to mastering? I mean, your personal preferences. And moreover, I'd like to know about your mastering chain, if you could throw some light on it, please. Yeah. Um, to, uh, I really love uh, uh, MS, I have to say, because my I don't really like to set uh, the pro, uh, um, dual channel devices like the PQ or the PASEC to set them both alike for stereo or almost both, both alike for stereo. What in, in, in my uh, setup on the Hermes, what I usually do is that I have my, the, the, the uh, iron, the PASEC and the PQ all in the MS block. So then I have all of the left channels are just doing the mids and all of the right, just doing the sides. Whereas the tape machine, obviously, you can't do mid and side, or I don't do mid and side on the tape machine. That's more for, uh, that stays in the stereo domain. So that's not part of the MS processing. And I also have uh, a stereo compressor, which is, uh, an, yeah, I, I shouldn't talk about it, right, Savi, because it's a No, you shouldn't, but you're I the shouldn't. boss, so you do whatever you want. Yeah. That's the beauty of being the boss. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, well, we have a, a, an upcoming stereo uh, a variable mu compressor, a, 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 a hefty beast, a nice one, easy to control. I, I give you a glimpse of this later just to trigger you guys. But that is a, that is a plain stereo device. So that wouldn't make sense in, in um, to put that into a mastering chain. Now, I know that there are some guys using... Um, series 500 modules, for example, and they usually are mono. And with this being using in an MS world, you don't have to bother about having two alike of these uh, uh, um, modules because you can use only one and you put that into the mid and the, the precision is just for the mid. You don't need to couple them. All of these thinking about, oh, need, I have to pair them. I have to, that goes away when you do MS. And that's one, uh, one thing that I really like about it. And the second thing is that you get this additional control uh, over the mastering. You can pretty much, yeah, it falls into two pieces that you can work with and you have better control about just the mid and just uh, the side signals. And I do compress them differently. Sometimes on the side, I don't even do any compression because they don't, um, they, the level is very low and you can leave the full dynamics on it. Whereas when you compress that, your stereo image becomes really um, squashed. And that is is not what I like. So I only use the compression on, on, the, on the mid. That is where I gain loudness. This is where I need to control the level of all of the very important and also level intensive signals like bass drum and bass guitar vocals all of that that is extremely loud and present there is what where i want to have the compression um under control um yeah so that my my uh lineup yes this is can you can you, would you go over so what i usually do is this is uh, i start with going MS, 
And the first thing I do is I'm using the PQ. That allows me to really first tackle frequencies and stuff that I don't really like or that I want to emphasize. Very precise, almost on a surgical kind of level. The next step I do is I use the IM so that I compress and work on, on, on mid, not so much on the side, but on, on, on the mid mostly. Then I'm, um, I close that MS loop now I'm back to stereo, and now I am uh, using the uh, first, this is the Venos, this is that little beast that I will, stereo compressor. Um, it's, it's not yet labeled. And then I'm going into the, the PESEC, and I use the PESEC to compensate for the frequencies that my insert loop on the, on the Studer actually creates the studer dams the high frequency but the uh, which is a good thing in many in many cases but if you don't want to have it being damping that much i use the pesec to just put more high frequencies into the studer so that, that's why i put it before um usually on the bass side i really love what is what the studer does to the bass um and and what I really didn't know until I got the real machine, because I have all plugins doing all of tape saturation effects. And I remember we had a machine head processor back in the 90s with the very first tape saturation. So uh, yeah, we've been in this for a long time. But honestly, I never had my own tape machine. And it's just like a one and a half years ago that I got the Studer A80. And I calibrated it, I got all of the tapes and I, I spent so many times and I repaired it and whatever until it really works. And, and what it gives to me is this tape glue. It's not, a, not so much about the saturation that get, it gives you more gain or more, more loudness. That's not really what it is to me. Um, the, the tape glue is everything falls in place nicely. It's, it's, it's a miracle. You just get your workstation to, to play the track and you listen to it and everything is there. Everything is, oh, you can, all of the, 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 the audio signals are present. But when you listen back from the tape machine, it really becomes like, oh, this is a song now. I cannot explain it any other than that. It's just everything falls in the right place. I don't know why that is. And my, my daughter, she's a musician herself. She just sat here and we were, I was mastering some stuff that she's doing. And I said, now, now, I'm, now I'm putting this tape machine on. And, and she was listening, listening to it and said, hey, now it's a big balloon. Now that is nice, leave that. And I put it off, huh? That's now all separated, everything beside each other. That, this is what I mixed. I said, yeah, that's, that's uh, no, put, them, put it back on the studer. So yeah. Um, that's my two cents on, on, uh, on tape machine and, and on my, uh, signal routing. Good. Thanks. No other questions so far. Okay. Um, then, um, we've been doing Come that. On one question here. Yeah. I wanted to know, so from the A80, what, what do you capture it into? What is your. It is just a send, send return loop. I'm sending. So it's it's basically like a processor. <laughs> I'm not I'm not uh, uh, using this to print on on the tape. Just the tape does its recording and playback. So I'm sending it onto the playback head, and the recording head picks it up. Uh, sorry, I'm sending it to the recording head, and the playback head picks it up and sends it back to the Hermes. Got it. So you're using it as a color device. It's yes. more for the color. It's an effect. Than for the saturation, which mm. you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. But then what do you what do you actually capture it to? Like what's your ready then? No, no, it's, it, it stays, in, it stays in, in the analog domain. After that, I'm, I'm going into AD for, to the workstation. Ah. I'm not capturing it from the machine. It is just an got, inserted got processor, like I would use any other to compressor color device to color yeah. it. But the yeah. saturation is one thing. And obviously, I'm, you can see what I, <laughs> there's a prototype. I'm just, so you could just switch yeah, yeah, over. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Thank you. You're too fast for me. <laughs> <laughs> See, here is here is a prototype that I'm just uh, working. Silver with. one, yeah. Yeah, the silver it, one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, these anodized, yeah. these switches are the remote control switches for the Studer. So I can I can press play and record from here, and I can wind back and forward from here. So because you only have 30 minutes on the tape, so you, you need to do this once in a while. And I don't always want to go over there. I just want to have it in, in that box here. And on this side, I have like a tape sent and a tape return. So I can saturate. This is plus or minus 10 to, to 15 dB. Not sure yet. You can engage them. And then you, um, you just have control over the send level to the machine and the return level. So thereby oh, wow. you can work on the saturation, but often oh, where you're seated, that's nice. It's yes, where you mean. seated, just in front of you, you'd keep listening to what you do. It's like as if this was your tape machine. That was the idea. Awesome. But I'm not sure when we're going to do it. We currently our biggest problem on this is that we don't get four, 24 volt LEDs. The, the circuitry of that studer is it is relevant to stay in the 24 volt domain and the LEDs or the lamps are part of the circuitry. If they are not working, the whole circuitry does not work. That's some kind of awkward, but it's like the lamps or the, in, in the original machine are like the fuse for that function. It's, it's weird. So uh, when you ever come across that and you see an a lamp is not working, it doesn't mean that the machine doesn't do the effect. You just put in a proper lamp, a new lamp, and then it works again. So. Hmm. Um, do you uh, Thanks, have man. another question, um, Herman? Yeah. Do you clip your converters when going back inside your dough? What do you mean by keep? My a, a clip. 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 A clip. Clip. Sorry, um, my English. Yeah, is yeah, yeah. Not good. Uh, oh, yeah. That's 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 a story on its own. I know. I I know that um, I've been talking a lot. This is one of the most. Well, we can talk about that's so that's one of the most controversial topics. Things you do as a mastering engineer to gain more loudness, which you don't want to get, let your customers see <laughs> that you do that. <laughs> So what 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 is it what we do now when you when you actually start to clip your converter um, there is a certain amount of um, full scale samples in a row that the human ear cannot yet detect as a distortion and that is typically about seven samples in a standard sample rate um, if you um, but having said that it depends heavily on your input signal. For example, if you use a snare, which is almost like a square wave, you can do like 200 samples, all full scale, and the curve would and you wouldn't hear it on a snare. But if you take a flute, which is almost a sine wave, and the first ripple it does, you already hear that it's a distorted flute. So even with just like three or four full scale samples in a row on a flute, you notice a distortion. So it depends now on your, um, on your song material, on the instruments, how hard you can actually do that before you hear it. And the mastering engineers, they select the AD converters to sometimes, not all of them, but by the forgivingness of, or, um, of the, uh, uh, when, when you overdrive the input and you run them into red and you clip them. So some of them have like a pre-clip filter um, that, that allows you to push harder into it before you actually hear a distortion. Now, all of this is, um, it serves the wrong purpose. To me, I mean, it's like doing the wrong thing for the wrong cause because we don't need to do that. The loudness is not, is no longer the, the, the so important in mastering, at least 
that's the way I see it. And that's with the coming up of the R128 recommendation um, of the ITU uh, um, and, and, and that all of the download portals literally uh, um, give you guidelines on, on, on the loudness units that you should run um, and, and, and the peak level that you should uh, not exceed. For example, inter-sample peak is an, is an interesting thing that where the plugins actually look upon, not the plugins, sorry, the, the algorithms on, um, and you can do that when you use the iTunes match uh, uh, plugin. It also, it tells you how far it will diminish the playback level for your mastering. And it takes a look at the inter-sample peaks. Now, what is an inter-sample peak? Well, obviously you have two samples and there are like, same same level so the audio would actually come up it would hit full scale it would stay on full scale and then it would go down again for that period that it is on full scale in digital there is no change in level but in the analog domain as, there is no audio curve that would ha have this behavior with a with a sharp edge so it would actually there would be a curve that would look like this like a wave and this difference between the samples, that is called the inter-sample peak. So a peak level that is between two full-scale samples. That might be a tenth, two tenths, three tenths, up to probably the maximum is three dB on inter-sample peaks when you totally have squashed it. Um, and then you have the playback algorithm will play it back with three dB less. So all the work that you did to get there is in vain. I, and, and I don't honestly, yeah, it's just my take on it. I just don't like to see the red light on my AD converter to go on. But I also know we're, uh, you've, well, we're obviously working on an AD converter and, and, and uh, the, the, the problem with the AKM factory that they still make the best chips, but the factory burned down and uh, um, um, in, in October 2020. And um, they're hopefully back in business, uh, shipping new uh, um, converters they save in, in the summertime this year. So um, our development was pretty much put to a halt because we wanted to have one of their uh, um, AD chipsets that was really cool sounding um, to build that. And while we're in the process of doing that, we already integrated the the uh, uh, the visualization of that you get the value of the inter-sample peak. You can read it on in a display on, on the unit then. So that gives you an indication for where you actually really are when you do that. And there is also one funny button. Also, be, this boils down what, what this question is all about. You can you have like um, uh, you, you you can if you use like three buttons at a time, you can make the red overload LED to not illuminate, so that your customer will not see what you do. <laughs> okay. I have another comment. Um... But considering the fact that dance music these days doesn't really consider dynamics anymore, club tracks go as loud as minus five LUFS. So is that approach good to gain loudness for club track? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, do what you want, do what is necessary. Everybody has his own take on things, right? It's, it's not as if, if we know what's right or wrong. And if the club track requires that, and on if you just make a CD release, yeah, you're free to do what you want. You, you, you can clip everything that you, if you like it, if it doesn't ruin the music. Yeah, I mean, club tracks these days, the production of club tracks, friend of mine does, does these things and he learned a lot in the last past two years doing it, the way they actually really work on how they set samples time-wise, not on top of each other, but slightly uh, separated in time so that they don't overlap, so that precision and loudness can be increased. There is a lot of things that you can, that you can do there. And clipping your converter, <laughs> do it. 
if you if it serves your purpose i don't know it's just my personal thing that i don't like to do that i'm not doing club music so i don't know the necessities there as well um another question more generic what are your favorite go-to mastered records where the engineering and emotion complement each other albums that you would recommend for critical listening uh, yeah 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 that is uh Honestly, I'm uh, currently um, starting to uh, my my vinyl collection. <laughs> In my youth, when everybody had record players, I didn't have the money, and I I only had a cassette player. So I was going to my friends, and I was there yeah, who had like a record, and and we I was capturing the the favorite tracks for critical listening. My, my music style is is definitely not useful for that because I'm a punk rock guy and I play in a punk band and I also play in a, in a classic rock cover band. So I like to, to, to play all these favorite, but it's, it's not where you would think that uh, there is high end music uh, and um, it's not jazz. Jazz makes me nervous in most cases. So uh, it's, that's not me, you know, but um, punk rock is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Green that's Day is great. Green yeah. Day is great. Yeah, for example, yeah. But um, what can I? What can I? Uh, oh, I have one one little story to tell about uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And um, do you know that Stadium Acadium um, recording that they did in two thousand six and seven? Yep. And uh, I got this uh, on on CD, and I was listening to it because I really dig their music, uh, uh, and and I was like. Oof, is that squashed uh okay so um i called up gary Lindet, who was one of the engineers on it and i knew that he was using transient designers from us for this and i and i, I gotta just try asking him if he, if he has a better source for that so he said to me well if you, i know what you're saying man uh, and uh and, and we don't like the cd too well either but what we did is we had like a two track half inch studer running um, right or being fed right out, out of the master bus on our console. And, and this is what the mix is. And there was no nothing changed on this mix. And that went to vinyl. I said, you're kidding me. Just the pure mix, no mastering, no. So I, I I was on a, on a trade show someday and 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 they had like an area where you, where you could buy records and I bought this album and there are four vinyl LPs in there for like 50 euros only at the time. I think currently I've seen people asking like 700 euros for it already. Uh, and I digitized them, put them on the screen, used Pro Tools for that and just compared the waveforms. When you do this with the CD, it's just a sausage. There is no change, no dynamics <laughs> left. Pretty much from the start, from the first hit to the last thing. One. And then you, you, you took, take a look at the vinyl and it really grows in level over time. And it really has like, when you listen to it, yeah, you have to make it louder. You have to use your volume control to listen to it louder if you like to. Actually, the volume control was invented exactly for this so and it's gorgeous it's gorgeous then recently i bought myself a Jimi hendrix experience uh eight vinyls 180 uh grams all from uh from eddie kramer uh who originally recorded uh, uh, uh jimmy hendrix and only sessions that they 52 sessions that they never put out and they were playing like uh Purple Haze with the chaotic endings because that never went to, to record. And all of the songs that you know suddenly appeared in a totally different angle, like they jammed it in the studio. Ah, that's what I love. That's just like musicians. Great stuff. Um, yes, I, I, I bought the Mono Masters from, from the Beatles. I said that last time on on that pure poor ab stereo uh that all of the 60s records were like oh no it's stereo we have to do stereo and they use pretty good mono tracks and made them stereo but 
it was never intended like that. I, I spoke about Geoff Emery who, who told me that and he brought me onto that. He mixed the, uh, um, since the Rubber Soul all of the albums for, for the Beatles. Um, and uh, Matt Cohen from Metropolis recently sent me, oh, and you put me onto this, Xavier. I, I, you said, uh, you once said, hey, have you seen there is 180 gram vinyls on uh, Peter Gabriel? Yes, very true. Yeah. Very true. So I was I was writing Matt because I I, I I Googled it and I saw that Matt was actually doing the the the, the lacquer cutting at, at Metropolis in London. I said, hey Matt, um you can can you tell me something about um about that? Because I was actually I've seen one of the shows in the 90s from 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 Peter Gabriel. And if that was part of it. So I didn't get a real response. And after two days, I got a response. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was you. Uh, no. And then, and then he went on and he was giving me the whole story on what it was. And it ended up sending me all of the versions that they did on, wow. on vinyl. So you get one when, you, when, you, when you're over here. Oh, nice. uh, <laughs> because you put me onto it. Um, other than that, yes, I'm, I'm collecting my old uh, stuff back then, my beloved records that I was using to hear when I was younger. Uh, and now I want to have them as vinyl. And I truly enjoy the fact of putting them onto a good record player and just, there is no skip button. You have to, you have to do this for like 15, 20 minutes. And even if there are songs that are not so good and are you, suddenly you hear them in the context and they are different suddenly you're just not so oh i go from hit to hit to hit no you you also that's what i like about vinyl it and you don't go there and skip so you just listen to the music so that's yeah i am that's where i spent my money on on collecting vinyls okay no further that's questions why having it that's why having a drink while listening to music on vinyl is very important because then you kind of just nurse that drink even in a bad song. So it was important <laughs> to cut kind of that. <laughs> okay, so where are we now? Um, oh, just, just very briefly. Um, I want to just... Uh, the Mercury, the DA converter, that's the first one. But I want to talk to you about the integration of oh. the MC16. Yeah, wait, wait a sec. I do, I do have uh, two questions regarding products. Um, the first one is, um, man, I've got a lot of things. Uh, SPL audio interface incoming. And another one is, are you going to develop a color box or saturation and et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, the second one is a big yes, because that's the Venos. Good. Wait a sec. I'm going to... Uh, let me just switch the lights on for this, like this. And um, this is the Venos. And you haven't seen that yet, because it will come some someday. I'm not sure when. Stereo, master, compressor. And that is a freaking saturation box and yeah i love that thing that i never got any more punch out of it than with any other even it surpasses the iron on, on on giving you punch up here you can see there is like different modes that you can switch this thing into so you you have a linear a modern a vintage a focus and a punch mode and an external sidechain the punch mode Oh, <laughs> that was one of those things where Wolf said, hey, Armin, you got to listen to this. What did you do? I did something wrong, I guess, but it sounds great. <laughs> you have to love <laughs> And I love these things. Okay, so, but that's, that's on this. Um, on the AD converter, the Mercury. Now, um, that's very straightforward. It, it, it uses the AKM chipset. Luckily, we have you bought in enough of them. You have like seven, uh, um, seven inputs two coax, two optical, two AES inputs, and a USB input, um, and a mute switch, which is important when anything goes nuts so that you can directly mute everything. Um, you have various sync options um, that you can select here by pressing the sync. It will go through all of the available um, syncs. So you can, now it clocks, for example, 
on your coax input one this is my cd player that sits there and it, it takes that as a clock but i can also use another coax input to clock but mercury says with this flashing hey buddy it's not connected and there's no valid information so i can't use that fine and i only have the cd player connected to this so that's why you see that um, there is an external wall clock obviously that you can use for that as well and another important thing is you can set reference level. So you just press the, um, the sync button and you see down there, and you hear the relays clicking, it walks through your reference. What is 0 to BFS? Is it 14, 15, 16, 17, and so forth, up to 24 dBU, right? And that's how you precisely match this with your AD converter and with the general level settings that that uh, um, that you run in your studio it's automatically goes back after two seconds to select the sample rate um, we have a fixed output and the variable output so there are um, you can use both and if you only have like uh, the simple way of monitor control is use this output knob and drive your main speakers from here so that would be like a preamplifier sort of built into into that device as well Okay. Uh, anything on the MC16 uh, as well, uh, Herman? Yeah, MC16. I need to um, I need to share my screen because I don't have it in here. I don't have like immersive audio. Uh, so I will uh, let me just go here on my on the, on the website, and I'll share my screen uh, like this. Is it? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Cool. So. MC16, um, see, there are the colors, for example, red and black and the rear panel. But let's just open this up and uh, let's take the black one for, for now. Now, um, the MC16 has a 16 gang analog potentiometer. It really is like about, yeah, 10 centimeters deep. And as, um, so that's your monitoring level control, fully analog. Also with this, this illuminated dot for a reference view. Then you have two inputs. One input comes from your 16 channel inputs. This comes from your um, workstation. And another one, input two, as a reference to compare, may come from, yeah, wherever, uh, um, an, an AV receiver type of thing where you have like another 16 channels discrete output that you can put there to compare. Then you have your 16 speakers and uh, you can now um, create presets. Let's say you have 5.1. So you would use, you would just switch on the first five and let's say your your sub, which is maybe the six number six, uh, and then you press A for two seconds, and again it flashes like you saw that when on 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 the DMC same principle, so it flashes and stores that. Now you want to make seven point one, and you select the speakers for seven point one, or you want to do like nine point one point six or 7.1.4, all these different uh, uh, Dolby formats. And you can do that and select that and store that as a third one. Now, while monitoring, you might say, oh, I only want to listen to the ceiling speakers. So you press solo and you select the speakers to, that are going to your ceiling. And now you have another three presets in active solo mode. So you do the same thing. And let's say on, on the first one, just the ceiling speakers. On B, you would take just the floor speakers. And on the last one, you may put only the front speakers, for example. So you have various solo uh, scenarios that you can monitor with. That's it, very straightforward, dim and mute. I don't need to explain that. So on the, on the rear side, you have all of these 16 outputs to your speakers, and you have like eight uh, inputs, uh, balanced XLR, another eight inputs on DB25, and this is for the input B, the uh, 16 channels. That's it. So very, very straightforward. Now, um, let me go to the DMC, because I wanted to show you how that actually integrates 
with uh, the MC16. See, that's all black DMC, and these inlays in that case are black as well. On the standard black, there are silver. And I guess you can you can take a look at this. This is the red one, like I have it here, the rear panel, and the standard silver one. Now, um, you see up here, there is this speaker A, and we have this circle around it. If you press speaker A for two seconds, it puts the DMC to sleep. And on the rear panel, here you go. On the rear panel, these audio feeds will be handed over to the MC16. So the left and right send and return and the return from, from, from the sub. So you can leave when you connect that with, um, I, I have a picture, I, I hope I have, it. oh, come on. Sorry, I think I have the picture on here. Let me just see if, yeah, here you go. Uh, let's, I hope it's not too complicated, but let's start here. The door, your decks, one to eight, nine to 16. The, this one is connected uh, um, to uh, uh, the empty analog. This is connected um, analog on XLR, and this is using the DB25. Now, the um, you, what, what you do is you use one and two, left and right. You feed those into the DMC. And you take the output of, of, the, uh, of the DMC and feed them into the inputs of the MC16. And the same applies for uh, the uh, left and right from and to the, uh, to the MC16 and the subwoofer here. So what, in, in fact, on the MC16, you, uh, on, on the, I'm sorry, on the DMC, you control your left and right speaker and, and the LFE in level. And when you put them to sleep, you can control them with a 16 gang pod in the MC16. So there, right, once connected, you, you, you can go stereo to immersive audio with just the press of one button and your whole monitor setup will switch. You don't need to touch any cables. It's just working like a breeze like this. All right. Any questions to that? Uh, wait. Some people are drooling. Do we have an ETA and some price on the new punch compressor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't even have that. <laughs> so keep drooling, man. <laughs> uh yeah no I'm, okay then i can stop the, the sharing i know that's a bit theoretical and but but it works and that's the that's the most important thing yeah look up with petrolis yeah that was luca that's right um uh, drilling in front of, yeah okay so that that yes i'm i'm at the end of my uh, uh things here and early <laughs> <laughs> Finally, after eight sessions, I managed to only go over it by half an hour. <laughs> That's pretty good, uh, Herman. That's pretty good. Uh, any more questions, there, Xavier? No, we, I don't. I don't have any. I have a lot of drooling, but I don't have any more questions. Yes, I have one. Um, what are your go-to rectifier circuits and side chain EQ curves on SPL Iron? Any interesting tips and tricks you would like to share with? which would work in most cases? Uh, the LED always works. Um, the, the, the silicon right next to it, pretty good. If you wanna be like smoothing it all out a bit and, and just be more gentle, that's when I use the germaniums. But my go-tos in the first place are always the LED and the silicium, those, those two. Okay, thanks. Uh, no more, no more questions so far. No more. No, on my side, I'm done. Oh, all right. Okay. So, uh, everyone, we are. How many are we right now? We are at 43 people still there. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for being here, and for all those people who are there for all the eight uh, sessions that we had with SPL, 
uh, with uh, Herman leading the pack and Xavier making sure that the back end was covered really well, no pun intended. And um, all of you took out your time to be here and I hope everybody kind of went away learning something or the other or something new that maybe they didn't know or got inspired. I mean, just to kind of take these devices and create some more magic out of it. Uh, that's hopefully that's what we hope you got out of it. A whole round of applause and thanks to uh, Vivin at Pro Musical, especially for putting it all together. And of course, Pro Musical, Sudeen and gang who have uh, managed to get us access to these wonderful gentlemen so that we can hear what is behind and what's inside those boxes. The 120 old rail thing is something really interesting and I'm really looking forward to trying that out. Uh, so, something which I was not aware of before these sessions began. So, you know, great stuff out there. And guys, I must say, whatever we've looked at all the devices which are there with uh, Herman on his console and all the ones that we use, they all really look nice and solid. I mean, they, there's nothing, you know, flaky about any of them. And that's really good to see and hear whenever I've used some of their gear, uh, it's been really impressive. Uh, Sai talked about using the Crescendo the other day and coming away totally blown away from it. Uh, so yeah, you have some great devices, you have some great products out there and you have a great guy leading it with some lovely stories behind all of them. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to trying them out, checking them out guys, Pro Musical is here. Uh, give them a shout, Women is there. And uh, I'm just so happy to be a part of this as well as to learn so much and get inspired. So once again, thank you, Mr. Xavier and Mr. Herman for giving us your time, sharing with us and just hopefully inspiring all of us out here to try and do something more beautiful than we already are. Thank you once again, Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, KJ. Cheers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I see that there are uh, in in the chat some some uh, someone was uh, writing. As much as I'd love to get my hands on all the hardware, any words on the SPL plugins and how they are <laughs> developed? Uh, yeah, we had like uh, in in the last session. We've been. I don't know if you were present there. Yeah, I, uh, I I just I just had, on a private message. I just answered to to him Aditya? or or her. I'm sorry. I just said we talked about this on the last session. You can ask Vivin for the recording of the, of the session. <laughs> but yeah. if you want to talk about it right now, you please. Oh, we can talk about it. We have we have we have the time. I don't know if we have if, the time. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I can I can just I can for those who haven't uh, been able to attend on on Wednesday. Yeah, we we uh, we left the the, the plugins out of the uh, demonstration here um, because that is something that is a business that uh, um, Plugin Alliance does, who is uh, our partner in in uh, with the plugins, and you can only buy them through Plugin Alliance. So, but I can encourage you to just make your uh, account there, and uh, you you can get everything to test obviously for free for like fourteen days or something. Um, on on developing plugins, one one initial note to that. Um, I remember when uh, when when Dirk Ulrich, the the, the, the founder of, of Plugin Alliance, and he had, at the point he was just just in Brainworks. Um, uh, I remember when we were he came to our company and and we wanted to go to IBC to. Uh, to Amsterdam together and and while riding there it's about a two and a half hours ride I was uh, um, I was saying hey you got these 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 nice uh, coding guys there Michael Masberg um, yeah I just he sent me a plug-in he's just a student and he was in in, in studied in in Bremen and and he sent me a pull tech uh, a plugin that he coded and I and I compared it with the universal audio plugin and I liked his better. So I invited him for for an interview and I employed him. So, so hey, shall, shall we do the, the transient designer? Then that would be a good thing to start with on the on, on the side. And so that's how we actually started doing that. And I, and I said to him once we, and when we had this ready, I said, hey, uh, 
wouldn't it be like a business model? I think more or less every company who's doing analog hardware is, is, is looking for a service because you, you cannot run an analog company and do digital coding in the same place. It's not like these are two different type of people doing it. It's, it's just really different. So, um, and, and he was thinking it, about it and, he, and then he did it and he really did it really, really, really well. I got really filthy rich with the whole thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember when, uh, and that's about developing digital plugins and analog hardware. The difference is how I see it. Um, the factor of surprise in analog experimentation and development is what gives you new things like, like the punch mode here on the, on the Venus, the entire vitalizer, we spoke about that before and uh, other things that just happen while you experiment and, and they blow your mind away with what you hear, but you would never be capable of thinking about that effect and then knowing how to write a code to achieve that. So as I see it, true innovation in terms of something really new that, was a, that surprises you when you hear it the first time won't be coming from a digital development side because that's practically impossible. How can you program what will surprise you? Furthermore, in digital, there is no such thing as a positive mistake. A code doesn't run, then a code doesn't run, full stop, and that's it, right? And, and it, it, I have never ever heard of a developer in digital who said, yeah, but then I, I, I changed this zero into a one and suddenly it sounded wonderful. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you, you heard that from analog guys. Well, I fed this into this and it did something totally wacko and I loved it. I just have to control it somehow, but then it's a great thing. Many, many, many inventions, not just in audio, are really uh, coming from, from experimentation and, 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 and things that have been developed for one side, but for one thing have never been used for that. Suddenly they, they've been used for something else. Teflon, Velcro, all of these things are popular examples for that. How they come to, uh, uh, how they've been now changing our lives, but they were never intended in the first place to be developed for that. It just was a side thing. Yeah. So then it's component modeling. That's that's the thing that uh, Plugin Alliance does, and I really like it. Literally taking the whole schematic. And on one by one, piece by piece, build the schematic into a digital, um, uh, yeah, into, into the digital flow. Uh, the problem is when you have always, when you have recursive structures, where you feed audio from, from somewhere back into, uh, so a, a feedback loop type of thing, which is rather which is possible in analog, which uh, because it's all real time, but in digital, it is not really possible because there is a processing time in between. So that makes recursive structures extremely difficult to, um, to digitize. Uh, but when we then have the full schematic put into, um, in, in, into digital and you're able to run audio through it, that's the time when, uh, when we start to meet in the studio at Brainworks and where we then start to compare um, one, one unit. That's also one thing that you need to keep in mind. It's only a snapshot of one product when it's been digital, digitized and not like multiple uh, um, uh, products. That's pretty much the workload would be overwhelming. So we take that unit and we compare how they actually behave. Obviously, on the if you have tube equipment, it sounds different when you warm it up compared to when it's cold. The digital side doesn't do that. So I sometimes get customers who say, well, I, I, I took exactly the same setting on my iron and I, and I have the, um, the plug-in as well. I did the same thing. It sounds different. So yeah, well, it should sound the same. No. Why should it sound the same? It's it's not the same product, it's not the same unit, and it's you cannot 
thing of it as this always being the same with what you get out of it. It does mimic one product as good as we possibly can mimic the analog hardware. So when people say it's like 80 or 90% of, of the analog side, then this is, um, this is some way of trying to, um, to get close to how good it actually is. But bear in mind, a plug-in, you can, you can use that on, 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 on how many tracks? Hundreds of tracks, if your computer allows you to do that. Analog hardware on two tracks at a time. That's it. So the, there is, from, from what I know, from our, my, what the customers who, there are two ways. Either they got to know the iron and then they say, okay, that's a cool compressor. I want to have the plug-in because I have like secondary audio uh, channels where, I, where that, what the iron does for them, totally sufficient. But for my main ones or for my master bus or mix bus or whatever, I'm using the proper hardware. That's one thing. The other thing is that if you run a rental place, well, everybody has plugins. Everybody has plugins, all of them. And I have zillions of plugins. And sometimes I haven't even, many of them, I haven't even opened up, to, to be honest with you. Um, but with analog hardware, it is there in front of you. They're always present. Customers come in, people come in, they are impressed. Oh, you got that? Yeah. Would you like to come, come, I show you. Fiddle around, playing with knobs, doing that thing that we all love. Um, that's, that's something where you totally switch off your eyes. And according to the Chinese philosophy, it's always about that senses you are your energy thieves. They steal your energy. So what they say, the less um, influence, the less use, usage you make of your uh, senses, the more you focus on your inner energy. I, I hope I get this straight and right. But to me, in, in the audio world, there is always this thing that we tend to look at something and make a judgment on how that what you see will sound like. Ask yourself how often you have questioned um, an EQ curve that doesn't look good. And how often you said, uh, uh, okay, no, oh, this is too much there. And you start to take them out and correct it to make it look nicer. Why? Why? Why is there so much trust in what you see compared to what you hear? And you're working on something that you can only hear at the end of the day and not see. So I remember uh, I was talking to Manfred Rürup. He was the guy who, who founded Steinberg together with Charlie Steinberg. So Charlie and Manny, they were close friends. And, um, and, and they started Steinberg back in the 80s, mid 80s. They're, yeah. And um, I don't know when, when we actually spoke about that. I think it must be like in the, in the 2000s or something. Uh, and he said, you know, I always wanted to have that blank screen button somewhere because I totally hated it when I was mixing that I saw all this, everything on the screen. And literally you see an event coming right on, on oh, now here here the symbol comes in here that thing comes in and you already know okay now you're going to hear this because it approaches and he said you totally don't listen to what is actually there you always pre-look at what will come you don't really listen to what you do and he was really enthusiastic about that point and i said to him hey honestly i never even thought about that yet but i guess you have a pretty valid point there uh, it's, it's, there is also the, 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 the moment of surprise when in, in music, a new instrument kicks in, a new lick comes up and you just say, oh, and you just feel it in the moment. Whereas when you look at the screen and you see how the waveform comes in and, and you, there is a preconception going. So it's not, there's not the same. And he said, so I wanted to have that hot key on the keyboard that is a blank screen. And every time you don't want to see the screen, bam, dark. 
and my guys in marketing and in they never ever went for it although i was the boss i couldn't get my team to do it and i ah, it was really odd about that so yeah i would a blank screen button still to come <laughs> hopefully someday yeah so trust your ears guys and and just do what 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 that what they tell what this tells you and um, um, that could be your uh, next year i think you guys started in 83 if i remember correctly and that next year would be your 40th year of spl yeah maybe that blank screen button is waiting for that to happen uh, yeah just <laughs> in your anniversary year <laughs> Yeah, I also just, wanted to share what you just said was very interesting. Uh, I mean, most people here would know about A.R. Rahman, the composer. When I started working with him, you know, if they saw the EQ curves he did, most people would just bolt out of the door, seriously. I mean, they were horrendous because he just believed in doing something so random and so extreme. Uh, just to give an idea, okay, suppose let's say he wanted something to be bright. So he'll end up on a shelf, which would be something like the maximum boost possible. It would, of course, sound horrendous at that point. But just to give an idea, I'm looking for something like that. Now, you go and decrease it to the point you want. But he was just giving you ideas. And if you saw that, you would always be like saying aghast. But his reason for doing that, and it worked in a lot of times, what he was doing, if you didn't see the EQ, what he was saying is so right. It worked for the kind of things that he wanted to achieve in the sound. But... If you didn't look at the screen. Yeah, if you didn't look at the screen. If Correct. you didn't look at the screen. Yeah. Yes, yes. If, if you just heard it, it worked. But the moment you looked at the screen, you was oh my God, what is he doing? Yes. Yes, exactly and, that. And there is, uh, I remember in the, in the mid 90s, I was, um, I had the opportunity to go to a seminar where uh, uh, right in Poolheim, Dirk Studios, uh, out right uh, in Cologne um, with uh, Bruce Swedeen. And uh, for those who don't know the guy, um, he is. Uh, if you those who don't know the guy, should leave. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. So you 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 can have Jeff Emmerich, the Beatles, and Sir George Martin, and you can have Quincy Jones, Michael and Jackson, Sweden. and Bruce Swedeen. So that's the that's the same caliber. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, and Bruce Swedeen, he uh, he uh, so they he had a track from from uh, the history album, I guess that he was just been that was just released, I guess. Um, and we were like 26, 27 people in that uh, in that recording uh, in in the in that studio room control room basically in the back of it, and he was in the front of it, and he was he was doing his thing, and and in a way that I've that we were standing there in the back and said seriously what the fuck is he doing right now <laughs> I, said, I don't know i don't have i don't know what is he because he was just like he was listening to the intro of the song for like 20 times and making meticulous correction on on the ssl then going over to the computers did something winding back playing again no not winding back he had used like a pro tools at the time already and uh, uh and he was just like i don't know how, how many times he was just working on that fade in of that specific instrument i mean <laughs> nobody would take that kind of care about it but he was but that's not what i want to talk about the 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 interesting thing was it first of all he uh People were asking, hey, you're using Pro Tools now, but you had tape machines before. How would you compare the sound between on the working with Pro Tools and, and, the, and the tape machine? And he gave the best explanation that, that I heard so far. So think of it like, it. So, so now you're standing in front of the, the, the Grand Canyon and you're looking into the Grand Canyon and you take your video camera with you. So now you film the Grand Canyon. So now you go home and you put that thing onto your TV. Hey, listen, I was at the Grand Canyon. And look at it and you go like, huh? that's not the Grand Canyon. And then you switch over to a Western where in Panavision, you saw that Grand Canyon in Panavision. And you go like, oh, well, that's the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and the color is totally too much red, too much sun, too much everything, too much color, but on the screen. It's beautiful. Whereas the video takes just a very clinical, cold image of the same thing that doesn't pair up with your image of what this should be. So 
the playback or the visual playback form of the screen uh, needs to have that uh, um, overdriven coloration to give the effect of what you really want. And then he said, this is what tape machine does for me. So with Michael Jackson, we've been using a 24 track Studer, the A80, and we were running them exactly like I do it like, like now. Um, we were just running all of the, um, the microphone feeds through the machine on the recording head and from the playback head, we got them onto the, on, onto the converters. Thereby, we catch the Panavision and once you do that, your digital representation still looks like the Panavision. Yeah. And then he was going on about influence of looking. That's where I just reminded me of that thing. Um, and he said, you know, guys, when you, uh, uh, when you work, make yourself a cozy environment. Switch the lights low. Light up candles. Light up whatever you find makes you feel calming down and nice and easy and keep it half dark so that the focus on the audio is there and that the, that, that the surrounding is not over shining everything else. That's what he said. That's what I do all the time. I dim all the lights. I put the candles up and I get myself into a mood. And in that mood, I do mix differently. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Long live Mr. Swedeen. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, he passed away. I don't know when he did, not, yeah. not that long ago, but uh, yeah. also a very, very nice gentleman. Very nice gentleman. Yeah, I met him. I had a fort good fortune to meet him. He's a really sweet guy. Very nice yeah. guy. Oh, I remember last session you were saying, uh, somebody was asking, can you, can you give me tips on, on how to set an, uh, a compressor and what's the favorite for that? Uh, hey, you know, I said, I don't do that. And that's because when I was at that place, literally, there were like guys sitting there with a note block and a pencil. <laughs> and they were asking exactly that question to Bruce. Right. And can you tell me what was the ratio setting on the vocals on uh, Dirty Diana? <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> and, he, and he went like, really? <laughs> <laughs> really? And the guy was totally puzzled that he couldn't tell him. And he said, I won't tell you. And you shouldn't think about it. You find your own thing. And you'd find your setting. What, what does that mean if I tell you something and you would apply that to one of your recordings that have been using totally different surroundings, microphones, electronics, everything else, and a different voice? Yeah. You know, you don't record Michael Jackson, probably. <laughs> and if you would, even then in your place, you would have to do something different. That, what is that all about? Tells me something about the insecurity that people do have when it comes to using technology. I take it from a very, very toy boy type of thing. I don't care. I just fiddle the knobs and see what it does. When, when I get new stuff from, from my, the engineers and they're going to say, hey, you're going to, you want to try that out? Take a look at this one. Um, yeah, you know the Rudy, the, yeah, you know what it, where you should go, but you, I always hit the extremes in the first place and just see where does it go? Where does it yeah. fall off the clip? What is it actually all doing? Is it, you know, these kind of things. And, uh, and then maybe that trained my own hearing. And I said, okay, we got to change this control and it only has a range that goes up to here because beyond that, that that's just nonsense. So, but until then, there are many scenarios where this really works superb yeah. i can only encourage everybody to to trust your to trust your hearing and to 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 work with that and that will make you a much better mix and mastering engineer because you can if you don't trust yourself on these decisions how can you think that your customer will trust your work absolutely Not good, yeah. and what you said about the extreme is very true i was talking to 
Brian Lucy, the mastering engineer in the US, and he said the same thing. He said, you have to train your ears to know the minimum and the maximum each hardware device. Only then you'll know where to hit it in between. If you don't know how far it can go, how do you know where to put it next time? So first is train your ears, the hearing part of it with the analog gear and try out all the knobs, see where they can go. What are the minimum, maximum settings that you can push the sound to? Yeah. Let it distort, let it overload, fine, but just hear it. So next time when you tweak that knob at that point, you'll know you'll, your expectation is close to where your fingers might land up on that knob. So do that. And I thought that was also very well said about knowing the entire extremes of the audio spectrum of that device, what it can do to your sound. So to then memorize it and then with that memory kind of bring it back what you want out of it. And so that's very critical. He says, you need to know your devices. And that's what the game is in the analog world, knowing your devices and not knowing presets, but knowing oh. your devices. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That has become some... Um... I remember Dirk is chasing me for presets when I, when I, uh, yes. And I say, Hey Dirk, really presets. Yeah. The people who just wanted, they want presets. What does that tell you? I mean, what really does that tell you? And I, when I try plugins and I walk through the presets and you go like, okay. 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 Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> um, oh. I'm, I'm more lost after that than I was if I didn't heard, have heard them. I, if you just go for it, because the thing is, if you, if you listen to preset, it tells me that you actually do not know what you want to do with that plugin. True. And if you don't know what to do with them, why use it? Why put it into the mix? Sometimes it seems to me, and, and, and I find myself making this mistake. Like I, I have like uh, recorded some tracks and I listen to them and I like them. Hmm. Then you go like, hmm. I have everything <laughs> to make something better or whatever. Can I do that? So you start to fiddle with stuff. Oh, you use that, you use that, you do this, you do that. And after <laughs> two hours, you like go like, um, it's not really better, is it? <laughs> it's hard to, to tell it to yourself that you just spend that time. With. But I did this far too often, I have to say, far too often, because I was thinking more like, if I don't try it, I will miss out on something. Yes, mm -hmm. there is a, there's a point to that as well. Yeah, right. But the sheer fact that you have this arsenal in your in in, in the digital in the plug-in world, you have we have all too much. You you just tend to believe that only with the usage of those you get to a proper result, and that is not true. Yeah, that is, no is yeah. If you don't need it don't use it and if you find a reason okay here's an issue i want to tackle that issue and i'm going to use a try this and this with that then you exactly know what you want to change and for that you don't need to walk through presets because they don't solve the problem yeah that's true. i have a i have a comment that says i think it was michael brauer not sure but the, yeah. the approach is different all these analog gear for the largest part stay on a fixed setting so that's like his color and also saves him the trouble of recall for different sessions exactly that is that is what i hear a lot um yeah. that's it's and it, it goes down to the fact that um mix engineers want to create their signature sound hmm. And, and this is where they're going to be memorized with. And, and this is also a commercial aspect, which helps them to be booked for that certain sound. Think of Chris Lord Algae, for example. He yeah. does the same thing. And, and, and so what they do, and I think they already, they also have like acrylic shields upon in, in front of them. So they have like a setting that they use for a kick drum, for a snare, for let's say vocal, I'm not sure about that, but for certain instruments, main instruments, they have fixed settings and they always gonna use that to create their signature sound. Well, I don't know. I, I, I also came across a producer I was helping out once 
who actually walked into a studio and asked the engineer, what's your favorite piece of gear that you use a lot? And he said, this, this, this. And he said, okay, throw them all out. We'll do this album without them. And it was a totally different new sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And that I've, I've, I've listened to mixes and when I, when I go to studios and, and, and then they are pretty proudly showing off with their latest big thing. And um, well, you cannot say that you don't like it. That's pretty much impolite that you don't do it. So <laughs> you either don't say anything or you congratulate. Um, but what I hear, what I heard in, in many places was that there was simply far too much going on in the mix. As mm -hmm. if there was an exploitation of all the effects and synths, plug-ins and, and, and library sounds and it was clustered and you just think to yourself what does it mean it was an impressive mix from 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 from, from the way it was done but what was it all about you couldn't really tell what the, what the music should give you it was just like i'm trying to impress you type of vin diesel uh <laughs> mix you know you go, you go like what the <laughs> yeah <All> right <laughs> but honestly I've, I've heard many many astonishing mixes from unknown engineers and and, mm -hmm. and and you sit there and you go like wow you can delve into this one this is nice and then they are so shy about it and they don't oh do you think it's really good and that like, guy do you like it yeah I like it yeah then it's good if you really like it and it's cool man unfortunately it's an art form that is not getting the respect i think it should get mm. huh? sure. yes mr xavier uh, pff, what can i say after that i mean <laughs> it's 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 wisdom <laughs> It's, wisdom it's just down. life. It's just life, man. Yeah. yeah. Cool, guys. It was so much fun hanging out with you guys. I think we should maybe repeat this exercise in a while again. Uh, once you've gotten over the shock of leaving all of us, I think you can come back. So, yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling that we've been doing this since December 8th that uh, I'm going to have, I'm going to miss this <laughs> every <laughs> week, two times, two times. And now it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe uh, if, if everyone here, whoever is here left 35 people, if you feel that we need to repeat this, um, get in touch with us and uh, we can probably figure out uh, select sessions, uh, maybe not at this length, but maybe uh, shorter sessions or longer sessions, whatever, or informal sessions. Uh, because it's always nice to just get on like this and just talk. Um, uh, you know, even if it's on topic, off topic, it's great to hear Herman and, and you know, uh, talk about things like this. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling. So I think uh, if anyone here wants to repeat, uh, just uh, let us know. My details are there in chat. Just write me up or call me and, and we'll try and make this happen. And, and a very special thank you, Herman. I mean, this is a lot of work. Uh, I understand this is a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort. Xavier, you too. You guys have really done so much uh, for India. And I, I really can't stop thanking you guys. Uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. I mean, for everyone who's been here, I think uh, they will all appreciate you for doing this for us. Uh, and Absolutely. I'm sure this will go a long way. Definitely will go a long <laughs> way. Thank you. Yeah, they, well, thank you guys. It was a, it was really a pleasure to do that. And and uh, SKJ in the beginning said yes, it's, this is a first for us as well. So I never did these kind of things in at, at that length and detail. And uh, I, I I was I was surprised that you all listened to what I to my waffling, and uh, <laughs> uh, because it's just my 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 two cents on 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 how life was uh, and 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 what I learned um, over that time and. Yeah, so that was also an experience uh, for me, and I, I'm uh, happy that I didn't bore the fuck out of you guys. So that's that's a good thing, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm here, and 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 we can do this if you like, and we can talk all off-topic things, uh, nerdy stuff. I love to because it's 
Yeah, there is not so much, you no, know, not so many people in my personal life that I can talk about on a, a, um, these these nerdy side of things, being like a mastering or a mix engineer and a musician and and stuff like that. So I'd appreciate if yeah, we can do that. Definitely. Yeah, I already have a topic for uh, Herman now. Xavier, please uh, remind him. Uh, we'll do a session maybe in two months' time, and the topic is going to be all the gear that Herman does not like. <laughs> oh, oh no. All, no! All the gear no. that gives him bad goosebumps. That's right, goosebumps. <laughs> goose bad goosebumps. <laughs> nah, nah. I'd rather like to talk about the opposite. <laughs> and that's not just our stuff. I no, no whatever. No, no, um, no, no that, uh, Herman. That's just a kickoff point. You see, that's just a topic to kick off and saying. I don't like that because I think this is better. So it just that's just a kickoff point. It's a trigger. It's not supposed to. Yeah, okay. To talk <laughs> because I I don't I don't like to 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 talk bad about somebody else's stuff or no, to no, just no, not say, I don't I don't like it. That's not what I want to do. That uh, no no no. And next cool. year is going to be uh, the pro a session for the promotion of his upcoming book. I'm sure. Ah. <laughs> right, Herman. I've been hearing a lot. I, I will, I will not it. let you go. I know you won't. This idea. I know you go, go Zevia, go Zevia. Yeah, it's going to be entitled The Bulls Creator Machine. Herman here. <laughs> oh man, that was my, my small contribution to the all everything. He doesn't like Avalon. It's just funny jokes, <laughs> but I like Avalon and, and I do like Vinton a lot. He's a nice guy, and he and he was one of, yeah, no, I the, if you got me wrong on his 737, <laughs> no, only the 737, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but no. Um. <laughs> oh, we, we already have, do have people that wants to have a yeah. signed copy of your book. Signed copy. Uh. There you go, Herman. More incentive. There you, oh, go. there you go. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> all right, guys. You guys Thanks all off. take care. Be safe. And inshallah, we shall meet soon. Yes. Exactly. Thanks, guys. Yes. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.